Hi friends, welcome to UGC ePartshala. Today we will be discussing a very interesting segment on forms and typologies of punishment. I am Suman Dash Bhattamishra, Assistant Professor of Law at National Law University, Odisha. So as we begin this interesting journey, let me first introduce you to the topic. Law and more specifically criminal law is the most effective method of exercising social control. The presence of a systematic body of rules signifies that there cannot be transgression of the same in any manner. Any form of transgression is a violation of the code of conduct laid down in law and is therefore socially inappropriate and undesirable. The idea of punishment is premised on the social understanding that one who violates the rules prescribed in the law must undergo some form of pain. Any form of punishment is premised on the universal principle. The quantum of pain, injury or loss to the accused may vary from one context to another, one society to another, one point of time to another. But what remains constant is the principle that anyone who violates the law needs to undergo some penalty. The purpose of the penalty is to cause some suffering to the accused with the objective of triggering repentance in him for the consequences of his unlawful actions. Now, as we begin understanding the segment, let me introduce you to the forms of punishment in criminal law. In Western philosophy, the philosophy of punishment has four theories and all these four theories occupy a very prominent place. They are the retributive, deterrent, preventive and reformative theories of punishment. Now, each of these theories of punishment is based on a certain philosophy of punishment which captures its purpose from a singular aspect. To have an overall understanding, an analysis of each of the theories has been given below. Now, let me begin with an understanding of the retributive theory of punishment. The retributive theory of punishment is based on the principle of revenge. It refers to the idea of making people undergo some form of suffering for committing crimes or offenses in society. The concept of retribution is known to mankind since times immemorial. Now, it will be apt to say that retribution is the most natural method of punishment as human beings are naturally predisposed to retaliate against aggressors. So, as we understood, Retribution is based on retaliation. Retaliation, revenge or violent reactions are expressions of passion and power which are not only seen among human beings but also among irrational organisms that is, as we all know, animals. Many scholars argue against the retributive theory of punishment perhaps because of the reasons cited above. According to them, Retribution compromises the nobility of human life. Apart from that, it is an expression of power and has its roots in the pain of an injury. Retribution has little potential to be a calculated strategy for curbing crime in society. It lacks the strength of rational and is logically weaker than other theories of punishment. However, both among human beings and among animals, retribution which is based on retaliation and revenge have been the common modalities of self-preservation, defense and therefore some scholars argue in favor of the retention of retribution as a modality of punishment. At this point, it will be important for us and worthwhile to trace the historical development of the retributive theory of punishment. Criminologists and penologists point that 
evidence of retribution as a socially and legally accepted modality of punishment has been found in ancient times in codes as old as the Hammurabi code of 1875 BC. In the initial years of its development, retribution was not a duty cast on the state. It was left open to the wronged individual to avenge himself by injuring the accused in some way or the other. These were also the times when crimes did not have any distinct status from private wrongs or injuries. Naturally, therefore, the power to punish was vested in the victim and retribution was seen as a legitimate method of punishment. An example of such retribution was found in the ancient German law where a husband was allowed to strip his wife in public, chop her hair off and expel her from the matrimonial home by parading her on the streets for committing an act of adultery. However, in later times, the power of retribution was transferred to the state through laws and personal retribution was made illegal. Scholars are divided in their opinion on the issue of efficacy of retribution as a modality of punishment. For example, Western scholars like Gluick and Dr. White argue that retribution as a method of punishment can do no justice to society or the victim. On the other hand, Stephen argues that retribution which is natural and is based on hating the criminal and acts amounting to crimes is morally justified and therefore as a modality of punishment it is completely acceptable in civilized societies. Whatever be the opinion of scholars on the matter of retribution, it remains a fact that till date it is an accepted modality of punishment all over the world and across all criminal justice systems of the world. There are two important functions that are served by this theory of punishment. Firstly, it sends across a very strong signal to society that if individuals act in antisocial manner or transgress the boundaries prescribed by law, they will suffer some loss or injury. Secondly, it also ensures that the victim has a sense of being avenged, thereby giving him a sense of social protection which helps in upholding a sense of security. Now, we will discuss the second theory of punishment, deterrent and preventive theory. Deterrence as a modality of punishment is premised on the principle that individuals in society must be discouraged from committing crimes. Conclusively, the deterrence model is based on very serious consequences for committing crimes and punishment patterns which have the potential to induce fear in prospective criminals and therefore discourage them from committing crimes in future. What defines the deterrent method of punishment is its striking characteristic of disabling the offender from committing any crime in future. A second purpose that is served by it is prevention of further crimes in society by forcing individuals to adhere to a certain course of action which is prescribed by the law. Deterrence as a modality of punishment draws its strength from exemplary punishment mechanisms. Exemplary punishment, the term connotes such form of punishment which is extremely harsh and painful. By using exemplary punishment mechanisms as a tool, deterrence models operate on the factor of coercion. Thus, the presumption is that individuals must be coerced to obey the law. The operative word being coerced, 
even if they do not wish to follow it. Bentham and Oppenheimer have argued that although harsh, deterrence as a model of punishment has served the purpose of general prevention of crimes in society, which in itself is the real object of any form of punishment. Death penalty and amputation are examples of deterrent or preventive models of punishment. A major drawback, however, of the deterrent model of punishment has been pointed out by modern penologists. According to them, any method of punishment should draw its purpose and relevance from the psychology of criminals, that is, from the reasons behind criminals committing crimes in society. Deterrence would perhaps be relevant in an age where people committed crimes on whims, caprices and fancies or for unjust gains. In modern times, people rationally choose to commit crimes. In other words, offenders commit crimes after weighing the pros and cons of the actions in their minds. This presupposes a complete awareness on the part of the criminal, the accused, of the consequences of his actions. So, these days people commit the act of murder after being fully aware that they may be awarded the death penalty or may have to go for life imprisonment upon being convicted in such cases. However, they cannot possibly be deterred from committing murder by inflicting death penalty. So, deterrence as a model of punishment may have been relevant in ancient times or in times which are not modern, but with the growth of population, intellect, science and technology, in modern times, traditional modern models of deterrence as punishment mechanisms are not sufficient to counter crimes. If physical disability alone is the deterrence we are talking about, then certainly it is an outdated concept in modern times. What works against deterrence even more is the fact that current methods of crime control are not as effective in nabbing criminals, leaving sufficient scope for them to escape penalties. Apart from that, methods of trial and conviction can never be foolproof, which means that if a person is wrongfully convicted and then given an exemplary punishment, that cannot be reversed. It is a matter of shame on the part of the state and an unforgiving compromise of the fundamental rule of criminal jurisprudence which says that even at the cost of a hundred guilty persons escaping the clutches of law not a single innocent person should be punished and punished in a manner which is erroneous. Ref reformative method of punishment is the third method of punishment which is a product of modern times and reformative method is a more progressive model of punishment. This is the third model of punishment that we are discussing. It has sharp adherence as well as opponents. This method of punishment is based on the idea that the objective of punishment is to do away with the evil and not the evil doer. In pursuance of this noble objective, advocates of the reformatory method of punishment argue that offenders should be reformed in course of the punishment and brought back to society. There are various methods by which the reformative method of punishment works and in various criminal justice me mechanisms reformative methods are used in combination with other methods of punishment. All methods of reformation are premised on counseling of the offender, 
disciplining him and restoring a respect for law and order by convincing him through various methods that the law exists for the individual and social betterment. Reformation is a noble and advanced mechanism of punishment and the primary benefit is that it aims at completely neutralizing criminal tendencies by a method of rationalization. However, there are many arguments against the reformative theory as well. The primary criticism against the reformative mechanism of punishment is that it is uneconomical. It has been a matter of concern for many as to why the taxpayers money must be spent on retaining antisocial elements in closed quarters and meeting their expenditure for daily requirements apart from special requirements like counseling etc. Apart from that, a major argument has been about the certainty of the impact of reformative models of punishment. Now, in other words, many scholars are of the opinion that the process of reformation as such need not necessarily work on offenders which not only leads to wastage of time, energy and resources but also keeps the society open to the risks of potential offenders who, by the way, may simply portray that they have undergone a reformation but may not have actually been impacted by it at all. Reformation as a modality of punishment, however, has significant use in case of young offenders. In India, the juvenile justice laws are premised on the reformative model of punishment. Consequently, young offenders are required to undergo special treatment and confinement in designated quarters for specific periods of time with the objective of shedding their criminal tendencies. There may be some loopholes in the reformative theory of punishment and like all other theories it may suffer from glaring shortcomings as well but but what remains true is that it cannot be completely ignored as a model of punishment all systems of criminal justice must incorporate some elements of reformation in order to achieve maximum benefits. Now let's discuss the expiatory method of punishment. The expiatory method or model of punishment is one which owes its origin to oriental systems of jurisprudence. Ancient Indian philosophy talks about expiatory methods. The core element of this punitive model is the factor of penance on the part of the offender. Hindu philosophy highlights the significant role of penance in the washing away of sins. Likewise, many other oriental religions and cults agree with the principle of a moral penance. The governing principle of the expiatory method is that the offender must undergo a certain form of penance which is equivalent to the gravity of the crime committed by him or her. By subjecting the body, mind and spirit to pain and suffering and going through prescribed rigor, the offender can absolve himself from his sins and crimes. Kohler is a proponent of the expiatory method and maintains that it is an effective modality of punishment as it not only washes off the guilt of the concerned individual but also purifies as a whole the humanity. Proponents of the expiatory method argue that for this punitive model to work it is necessary that the punishment suffered or the penance undergone by the offender must be equivalent to the pain of the victim who has suffered the consequences of wrongful actions. However, it is logically 
not possible to standardize pain or to even assess the extent or quantum of it in the context of a victim. The same act may induce pain of varying degrees in different persons. Ancient Indian scholars have attempted to quantify pain in various contexts and those contexts and subjective factors have been taken into account for fixing fines on many occasions. For example, killing a cow was considered to be an offense but killing a goat was not. Likewise, killing a Brahmin was considered to be a much greater offense than killing a Shudra. Similarly, having sexual intercourse with a woman who had renounced the world was considered to be a much graver sin than adultery as it involved a married woman. So, in ancient India, there was an attempt at grading pain and suffering of the victim and deciphering the gravity of the offence after assessing it. However, such gradation of pain cannot be said to have been undoubtedly exhaustive and rational. Grading pain and pleasure of the victim and defining the penance of the offender by referring to that is a problematic proposition and a dubious one and this has been the biggest the largest in fact undoing of the expiatory method. So what exactly is the right method of approaching crimes criminality? This is where we will look at the integrated model of punishment. An analysis of the above methods of punishment will suggest that not a single model of punishment is free from errors. They all have shortcomings and neither of them can implement social control by themselves. For example, a criminal justice system which is based on retribution alone will be a savage system bereft of the nobility of a restorative mechanism in society which can be brought about by the reformative model. Similarly, expiatory method of punishment will be redundant in modern times and will be thoroughly unjust towards the victim as well as the accused. Likewise, deterrence alone will ensure that we take several steps backward into the old stone age where man was barbaric and there was no trace of civilization. Reformation alone will be a soft modality of punishment that cannot maximize social control and prevention of crimes in the interest of protection of law and order in society. It will not ensure the highest degree of social control. It is necessary to appreciate the merits of each theory of punishment and at the same time we can also infer that shortcomings of each of these theories can be blocked by unplugging the benefits of the other theories. So, essentially a criminal justice system in order to be effective must emphasize on the combination of all four theories of punishment. Based on the above theories of punishment, penal laws all over the world are of various types. Most of the criminal justice mechanisms have punishment provisions which incorporate a combination of various elements of these methods. For instance, the Indian Penal Code has provisions of incarceration for various crimes which are retributive in nature. It also provides for the death penalty which is deterrent in nature and seeks to prevent the commission of crimes. Likewise, for dealing with young offenders, the legal system provides for the Juvenile Justice Act, which by nature is reformative. At this juncture, it will be worthwhile to take a look at the types of punishment that are found in the criminal justice systems around the world. Imprisonment, imprisonment or incarceration is a popular method of punishment. It dwells on the idea of isolation of the offender from the rest of the society. The purpose of confinement is twofold. 
Firstly, to prevent any further chances of antisocial activities by the offender and to withdraw the benefits of social life from him. This type of punishment is retributive in nature. In India, the Indian Penal Code makes provisions for simple and rigorous imprisonment. While simple imprisonment is not accompanied by manual labor during incarceration, rigorous imprisonment is accompanied by manual labor. Now, this is imprisonment for a term. Apart from that, the IPC also makes provisions for life imprisonment. For grave offenses, the IPC makes provisions for life imprisonment. Life imprisonment essentially means imprisonment for the remaining period of life of the offender. The idea is to completely isolate the offender from civilized society for the rest of his life. Death penalty is the other method of punishment provided. Hanging to death or death by electrocution or by lethal injection is based on the deterrent model of punishment. In India, we follow the policy of hanging the person to death. This model of punishment exists for the purpose of inducing fear in the minds of prospective criminals. In India, death penalty exists for crimes of exceptional depravity. Other than that, fines are also prescribed criminal sanction in penal codes all over the world. In the Indian Penal Code also provisions are made. It is to be kept in mind that unlike civil wrongs, criminal wrongs can never be corrected by economic enrichment, damages or compensation. However, penal codes provide for levying of fines on offenders as an additional element. Sometimes courts can make provisions for meeting the expenses of the victim's litigation from the fines which are paid by the offender. Fines are in the nature of an economic loss to the offender and are generally clubbed with another form of punishment like incarceration. Deportation is the other modality of punishment. In older times, deportation was a preferred form of punishment in many parts of the world. In modern times, deportation is an accepted form of punishment sparingly for very serious offenses which are generally international in scope. In India, deportation is no longer an accepted modality of punishment for domestic crimes. So as to conclude, we, since we are reaching to the end of the segment, all modalities of punishment are inspired by the social necessity to maintain law and order. Whatever be the modality, form and content of punishment, its ultimate objective is to exercise social control. A fundamental principle, however, for the types of punishment which have been discussed is the principle of proportionality without which punishments can never be fair and unbiased. So with this, I would now like to summarize the entire segment, segment for you. So the first thing we need to remember out here is that there are four primary models of punishment. First, retributive, then deterrent, reformative and expiatory. All forms of punishment have shortcomings as well as benefits and so an integration of all models is very crucial. Retribution is a model of punishment which is based on revenge or retaliation. Reformation is a model of punishment which is based on restoration of the offender. Deterrence as a model of punishment is based on inducing fear in the minds of criminals or people so as to discourage them from committing crimes in future. Expiatory method of punishment, on the other hand, is based on the practice of penance for erasing guilt on the part of the accused. The Indian Penal Code makes provisions for life imprisonment and death penalty 
as deterrent punishment mechanisms for preventing individuals from committing crimes. The Juvenile Justice Act is an example of reformative model of punishment. Now this is what we discussed in the entire sub segment. Apart from the points that I just summarized for you, it is also important for you to know the difference between imprisonment for a term and life imprisonment, simple and rigorous imprisonment. On this note, I would like to conclude the segment for you. Thank you.